Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In a special anniversary edition marking the 100th episode of the podcast, Richard and I take the opportunity to draw on themes from the show's first two years while unpacking the surprising meaning of Genesis chapter 47. An epilogue to our six-part series on Galatians, this week's episode also serves as an introduction for Walid Issa, the keynote speaker at Bethlehem 2015, an interfaith event hosted at St. Elizabeth Orthodox Church in Egan, Minnesota. This week's show was recorded in front of a live audience. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you're listening to episode 100 of the Bible as Literature podcast broadcast live from St. Elizabeth Orthodox Church in Egan, Minnesota. So this is our 100th episode. We just came off a six-week series on Paul's letter to the Galatians dealing with the question of the opening up of God's tent to be inclusive of all the nations, Mm -hmm. to make sure that everyone feels welcome. Right, and the theme of freedom is something that's very important, of how God allows freedom, whereas people force slavery on people, and the big distinction between how God functions and how humans function in Galatians. With respect to slavery, we tend to think about the enslavement of God's people in Egypt as being a one-directional example of abuse, but in your own study of Genesis this past week in the Ephesus School, you noticed something really important about the last few chapters of Genesis that undermines even this idea of Egypt being the sole abuser in the relationship between Israel and Egypt. Do you want to talk about that? Right, yeah. When you're looking at Exodus, I mean, one of the things that you notice is that it seems like Pharaoh just non sequitur just says, hey, Uh, We could be making some more money off these people. Oh, if they were to get more powerful than us, if they were to join up with our enemies, then they could fight against us and we would be defeated. We need to go enslave those people so we can keep them under control, right? And it just seems like Pharaoh is a bad guy and Pharaoh is like the typical bad guy. I mean, he's the prototype, you know, the evil, sadistic ruler is Pharaoh. And it's as if it comes out of nowhere. But then looking at Genesis, I was really surprised because in the story of Joseph, we always understand Joseph to be the good guy. Joseph is the one who, in spite of his brothers oppressing him and enslaving him, and in spite of going to prison once he's with Pharaoh and in Egypt, he's good to Pharaoh, he's good to Egypt, and he's good to his brothers. He never says or does anything bad towards his brothers. He messes with them a little bit. He puts them under a little pressure. But then he lets him off the hook. And Joseph seems like such a good guy. If there's any place where it seems clear cut, it's between Genesis and Exodus, where Genesis has Joseph, the good guy, and Exodus has Pharaoh, the bad guy. It seems very clear. And then in reading more carefully, chapter 47, strangely enough, after Joseph goes and gives his people the opportunity to live in a fertile, good land, He then goes and he starts giving out the food that is available in the storehouses. If you remember the story in Genesis, over seven years, they stored up grain so that there would be extra grain for the coming years. Okay, so the coming years came, the years of famine. And so the Egyptians, they went and bought all the grain that they had until Joseph had all the money. So what do they do now? Joseph makes a deal. Give me your cattle. Give me your horses. He gets all the cattle and all the horses. Well, what do we do now? All we have left is our land and our bodies. He says, okay, give me your land and become my slaves. Joseph enslaved the Egyptians from one side of the country to the other, the text says. Joseph enslaved the Egyptians 
before the Egyptians enslaved anybody. And isn't it interesting that at the end of Galatians, after Paul has been insisting repeatedly that the Galatians should not give themselves over to slavery on the one hand, to the leaders of the church. On the other hand, he is criticizing and attacking the leaders of the church for using circumcision to assume a position of power over the nations. And suddenly you have this accusation, essentially, that they are becoming Pharaoh. They are becoming Caesar, James and Peter. And at the end of the letter, Paul warns, you will reap what you sow. And that's exactly what is happening in Genesis. So Paul is effectively exegeting Genesis when he talks about reaping and sowing, not just the prophetic text. I mean, it's amazing to me. Joseph is so generous because his brothers, when they come to buy grain from him, he slips the money back into their bag saying, oh, don't worry, this one's on the house. But then when all the Egyptians need food, he takes every last coin from them. And he, in the end, leads the people into slavery with Pharaoh. Specifically, it says so. Not only does Egypt own all the land, everybody in Egypt now works for Pharaoh and they owe him 20% tax on everything. And it says this is how it is until the present day. So when Pharaoh enslaved the Israelites... There was already this law in place. Joseph set it up to make it easier for Pharaoh than to enslave the Israelites. He's the one that set it up. So I think when Paul is exegeting this, I think he sees that there is this cycle that happens. It's in the prophets. I mean, we've talked extensively on the podcast about the problem of the victim mentality. Scripture is very clever in the way it entraps the addressee. Because its invitation card is the depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus, the public portrayal of his shame. And initially, when people come into contact with this teaching, they identify the shame of Jesus Christ with their own sense of having been victimized. But the difficulty for them, once they accept the teaching of the cross and identify with the shame... The difficulty is that scripture always turns that against you and shows you, in fact, you're not the victim, you're the oppressor. It does so systematically because out of a sense of losing security, especially in the minor prophets, out of a sense of losing stability and abundance, people become fearful. And in becoming fearful, they develop the sense of being the victim And then they look to those who wield power, and in biblical terms, that's the power of death, to provide security. But once they do that, they're giving themselves over in bondage to something that Paul would say is passing away. Right. And the thing is, is that they have to remember that they are always in bondage to the one who gives them all this. That the gift they receive from God is always how they have to function. They have to function as one who received a gift for no good reason. And what's striking about Joseph is that he's always telling his brothers, don't worry, God put me here so that you could have life. But then while he has the power and he says himself that God put him there, he does not give life to the Egyptians. Well, he does but he extracts quite a price for giving them life. But what life is it? Right. If it's not sustainable, if there isn't a sustained brotherhood, which is what Genesis is consistently pushing for, especially in the narrative of Abraham, who was really the first Hebrew-speaking male to make peace with the Philistines. I won't say the Palestinians because I don't buy into the Zionist narrative of this ancient history. There is no ancient history. We are modern peoples. We have no connection to the ancient past of the Levant in terms of national identity. The way that you can tell that Joseph forgets and he thinks that it's all about his identity and his clan and taking care of his people because he's very generous when he talks about his brothers and he's not as generous when he talks about the Egyptians. And the one thing that struck me also is that the Lord is not mentioned after chapter 39 until one or two instances in chapter 49, and that's it. The word Lord never comes out of Joseph's mouth, strangely enough. In 39, three times the Lord showed loving kindness, chesed, 
mm. to Joseph. And it keeps repeating this over and over while Joseph was in prison. When he was in prison, he received the gift of loving kindness of the Lord, which then allowed him to gain power later on. But he never shows chesed to another person, except his own family. Right, which is a sin. People view scripture as being pro-tribal, pro-identity, but it's actually dynamiting the whole system of tribe and identity. Here's the thing that's really important, though, for our listeners to understand. When you hear the scriptures in English... You hear the word God, you hear the word Lord, and so forth. You just assume it all means the same thing, but it's actually much more complicated in the original languages. So Lord has a very specific meaning. It refers to the name Yahweh in Hebrew. Right, and in 39, it ties it very closely with the one who shows mercy. So the one who shows mercy, the Lord, Yahweh, who shows mercy, does not come again from the lips of Joseph. Joseph does not show mercy except to get his own way with his brothers, which is not mercy. It's manipulation. There's a difference between mercy and manipulation. When God shows mercy, it is not for manipulation because he can manipulate things anyway. He's God. (laughs) He can create a whirlwind. He doesn't need to manipulate people. People manipulate people. And this is exactly what Joseph does. So in this way, Joseph is like a parallel to Solomon, who's given all this wisdom, this skillfulness, the ability to interpret dreams, the ability to judge. But then what does he do? He then enslaves people Mm. with that gift. And with Solomon, it ends up being the end of Israel, and it is divided into two countries. And with Joseph, as soon as Joseph is forgotten, the Israelites are enslaved. It It ruins Israel. Well, it ruins its characters generally. It certainly ruins and undermines Israel, but it ruins even Joseph I mean, when you read Genesis, you're hard-pressed to find any character that isn't compromised. And I think this is an important point to draw out as well. It's not that people are compromised a la Shakespearean literature. That's not what Scripture is saying. It's saying something much, much more diabolical and difficult to swallow, but much more reflective of the way life works. And that is to say that good things happen to people who commit tremendous acts of wickedness and bad things happen to people who may do what is perceived to be good in the world. And the point in scripture, and this is the way it's brought out in the Pauline school, is that everything is grace from the hand of God. I mean, if you look at Jacob, Jacob was essentially a very difficult, very ugly character in the way that he behaved throughout the story. Isaac was the one who was special, which is why Paul draws on the line of Isaac. But even Abraham was a very difficult character to swallow. And it begs the question, why systematically is God giving the blessing to these people who don't deserve it? Again, it touches on the notion of grace, but I think more importantly, especially tonight at St. Elizabeth, where we've invited a guest speaker to talk in a broader context outside of Scripture, It touches on something important about the way life works and about sociology. There is no reason to explain why good things happen. There is no reason in life to explain why bad things happen. The idea that things proceed from a reason is a theological, philosophical, Hellenistic concept. It's not scriptural. Scripture is a Middle Eastern text, which means it's ruthlessly practical. It looks at the way things are and assigns meaning. That's the key. Why are there earthquakes? If you say anything other than there are two tectonic plates that shift and bump into each other and it causes a rumbling, if you say anything other than that, you're either illiterate or you're a platonic dreamer. Because the fact is, earthquakes are caused because there's a geological event. Now, if you start talking why, then you're talking literature. And for scripture, the literature that you're dealing in deals with wisdom and how to behave correctly. So it turns fortune into a reminder of the blessing, and it turns misfortune into a reminder of the judgment. Whether it's an act of man or an act of nature, But with respect to the things that human beings do, then you have this very special edge that Jesus expresses in the Gospels. 
If you slap someone on the face, or if someone slaps you on the face, rather, you give them the other cheek. But the inverse of that in the prophets is, if you slap the Babylonians, you better believe they're going to slap Israel back. And when they slap you back, know that it is the Lord who is striking you. And it's not because God is striking you. We have to just think logically. It's because the teaching is explaining to you that this is how human behavior works. When we understand this, then we can look at our own actions. When something bad happens to us, the question is, what can I do? Correct. What can I do? How can I change my behavior? How, how do can I, I change, respond to this? How do I respond to this in the correct way? Yes. What do I do in order to help others when this happens to me? When tragedy befalls me, when death befalls me, I have either a victim mentality I can fall into or I can move into action. You can view suffering, as they say in the Greek text, as a keros, as an opportunity unto instruction, which for the scriptural tradition is unto life and hope. Now you take a step back now and you think about what you're saying about Genesis and it brings to bear in some respects an even harsher judgment on the current situation in Israel and Palestine than one would presume when just reading Isaiah or Jeremiah. I mean, you read the prophets. If you read the prophets correctly, if you don't pick and choose and write your constitution about how you wrote the Bible and gave the Bible to the world, which, according to the tradition, is blasphemy. Israel did not give the Bible to the world. The Bible gave the Bible to the world, and it was addressed first to Israel as a judgment, just as the New Testament brings the judgment against Israel against the church. You're never going to convince me that any community is going to write a book that undermines the community. It's written from the outside in judgment, and as you know, that's why the prophets always announce God's judgment in the Old and New Testaments is coming from the outside to the inside. But this is the key that it undermines. So now you think about how what you're saying about Genesis, you have a situation where the Israelis and the Palestinians are locked like this. Now set aside the politics and set aside the ideology about the statistics of numbers of who's right, who's wrong, who's been victimized more. All of that ultimately leads nowhere because it follows the logic of Joseph. It's his logic. Let me do an accounting and see how I can best benefit my brothers. When, once you start doing an accounting and trying to make sure you can take care of your own and provide security for your own, you are beginning down this path of the tit for tat. It's inescapable. You're handing yourself over in slavery. Now, what's really interesting is that the only way out of that slavery and I would say from a scriptural perspective in the modern Middle East the Jews and the Arabs are enslaved to the power of death that's the language of the New Testament the power of death isn't about dying people make out of Christianity this go free pass to get around death because people who have a lot of prosperity in the West are afraid of dying but everyone is not afraid of dying. And those of you who have lived through war or suffering know that not everyone is afraid of dying. It's not death that is the enemy, per se. It's the power of death which is wielded by those who control money, resources, and armies. Which is precisely who Joseph is. Exactly. Joseph is the one who is second only to Pharaoh, and you don't hear anything from Pharaoh. Pharaoh only speaks to say, Joseph, do what you need to do. That's all that Pharaoh does in Genesis. And in Exodus, all that Pharaoh does is forget Joseph and then take over and enslave the people. And wielding this power of death is the way that leads to the people's enslavement. Absolutely. And that's, that's what happens is when you wield this, you wield the power over others. It always leads to slavery. This is the problem. It's not possible to be in power, and to do things as you want to do them without enslaving other people. That's just how it works. The only alternative is, as Paul says, you have to die. You have to be as one who's dead. And this is the one who no longer lives under the power of death. It's the one who understands that he's just a breath. You know, Father, we talk so much yeah. about Ecclesiastes and how really the wisdom of Ecclesiastes comes from understanding you're going to die. 
you're only a breath. And Paul says, you're only a breath, you're dead already, and so what do you do? You might as well love. And that's the thing with Paul, is that Paul fills that vacuum with love. With love. The ultimate freedom he fills with love. Because, why does he fill it with love? Because if he does not fill it with love, then the freedom that you have is going to be the freedom that Joseph has, which is the freedom to enslave everybody you can. There's a way out for Joseph, and that's the key. And Richard just used New Testament terminology when he talked about dying. It doesn't mean literally dying. It means being in the frame of mind with the attitude in this present life to not care about possession, to not care about victory, to not care about achievement, to not care about security, so that Donald Trump could not scare you Even if it was true what he's saying, which we know it's a lie, he could not scare you because you're already dead. So what happens if someone kills you? Big deal. So that when you look at the stock market on Tuesday morning, you would not live in terror of the results so that you can be manipulated and prodded to do whatever the institutions want you to do because you don't care about possession. So that you couldn't be manipulated and used to support all of these agendas that pertain to things that are temporary and passing away. When you're afraid of dying, when you're afraid of keeping yourself alive. Afraid of losing something. Afraid of losing, that's when you're under the power exactly. of Caesar. I mean, but also Pharaoh, because you look or at Or the, under the Israelis and the Palestinians in this context. Right. The Egyptians gave themselves over. They didn't have a choice. In the same way that Esau had to give up himself in order to get food from his brother Jacob. They weren't willing to give that up. And... Jacob, as a father, was not willing to give up his son in the way that Abraham was willing to give up his son. And as a result, he was miserable and all these problems happened. You keep seeing it time and time again in scripture where the one who is afraid of losing is the one who's enslaved and also enslaves. When Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross. Now, what does it mean in the Roman Empire, if you're going to pick up your cross, that means the trial is already done, the sentence has been given, death is all that awaits you. Your lifespan is between here and the top of that hill. That is how long you have left to live. That is your life. What are you worried about at that point? Are you worried about what you're going to eat tomorrow? Are you worried about taking care of somebody? Are you worried to make sure that you've got this and that all in order? No. You aren't worried about anything except dying. Are you worried about whose fault it is and who's to blame and whose turn it is to fight back? You're not worried about any of that. No, those darn, they they convicted me. I'm so upset with them. You're past that point. (laughs) Hopefully you're past that point then. Well, if you're not, then (laughs) then you haven't figured out that you're about to die. (laughs) You know, I think it's a good opportunity here to draw this discussion to a close this evening. What's really important about your observation about the connection between the Egyptians and the people of Israel, the children of Joseph, in the story of Genesis, is that the slavery that both peoples enter into under Pharaoh in the narrative is a slavery that can only be overcome. And this is what Paul does in Galatians. This is why it's such a powerful observation you made. It's a slavery that can only be overcome when the tent is broadened to include everyone. The solution to the problem in the text is the same solution to the problem we have today between these two modern peoples, the Arabs and the Jews, the Palestinians and the Israelis. They can escape all of the tyranny of their respective situations by embracing each other. If Joseph had said, like Isaiah, come eat without money, drink water without paying, then the Egyptians would not be enslaved. And the system for the Israelites to be enslaved would not be there. And the Egyptians later on would not have felt threatened and insecure. Of course they felt threatened that the Jews were growing in number in Egypt. Because look, when there were just a few Jews, look how they treated the Egyptians. That's the point. And this is scripture talking, friends. We're not making this up. If you're troubled by what we're saying, go read the story. We'll rejoice if you prove us wrong. I want to say one more thing with respect to the presentation this evening by our guest speaker, Walid Issa. He talks often about peace 
being a gift. And I know he'll touch on these themes this evening. And he says very prophetically that it's the gift that people offer to each other. And this is, I think, a universal secular way of expressing the meaning of the biblical tradition. Because all scripture can do is propose wisdom. And I know tonight that Walid is going to propose wisdom for all of us to ponder and to consider. But that's all scripture can do. That's all someone like Walid can do. He can only present wisdom. And people can take it or leave it. But scripture goes further to say, you take it or leave it at your own peril. If you treat each other poorly, you will receive the result of your actions. If you offer peace and love to each other, you'll hopefully receive peace and love. You're the ones who can do it ultimately. But your actions defer the credit to the wisdom offered. But you're the ones who are responsible to do it. And so I'm very excited to hear his presentation and we'll wrap up the podcast for today. Thanks very much. Dr. There's something I wanted to say this evening before I introduce Walid. I've always been aware because my parents are immigrants from the Middle East. I've always been aware of the invisible I would say passive aggressive attitude towards people who speak with an accent or whose skin is a little bit darker, people who can't easily acclimate to American culture. But I think, as um, Noam Chomsky points out, there's a special kind of disdain in Western culture that predates the United States towards the Semitic cultures. And I say the Semitic cultures plurally because I think as we alluded to in the podcast, it's so important for Jews and Arabs to understand that they are in the same predicament together, a predicament that was created by the geopolitical selfish calculations of World War I. They are both in the same predicament. And there is a unifying anti-Semitism that has contributed to this problem. But it's always, always, always under the surface. And right now, because of our own country's policies, it's easier to express this anti-Semitism against a people, and many peoples who we call Arabs, who are denied the right to claim their Semitic heritage. They are part of the same family of peoples as the Jewish people are historically. Well, you know also that in the last few weeks, this racism, like the racism against our own President Obama, whatever one's politics are, I have no interest for politics in case you haven't figured that out. But the racism that has been expressed against our President openly, in a kind of disgraceful, shameful way, is now also being expressed openly and very shamefully specifically against Muslims. People often ask, how could what happened in Germany in the 40s have happened? The Germans weren't bad people. Why is it that out of the blue you had this terrible mistreatment of the Jews during World War II? And now, sadly, I can turn the question around with an overt example. I used to try to explain to people that our behavior reflects the same teaching that animated the behavior of Germany during World War II. The only difference is we view ourselves as the good guys, but I know from scripture that no one is good but God. But now I don't even have to try to make that case because if you cannot see that what Donald Trump is saying about Islam is the same ideology of hatred and fear, then you are blind and deaf as we hear in the mighty prophets. You have wax in your ears. And so when we set this talk, it was before this had really, really come to the surface. And I'm so thankful tonight to be able to welcome a Muslim to speak at St. Elizabeth in this climate. 
because it is important, I'm saying this especially for our parishioners, that we always remember that God's tent is broad and keeps expanding and it's open to whoever wants to be a part of that fellowship. So I'm honored to introduce Walid Isa, who is originally from Bethlehem, from the Dehesha refugee camp, just on the outskirts of town, which was established after 1948. He's going to talk about his journey, and as I said, offer us his wisdom this evening. So please, a warm welcome to Walid Isa. Um, thank you, uh, Abuna, and, uh, and it's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm very excited, actually. Um, it, it feels like home with the food, with the people, with the faces, and I, I cannot be more excited to be here. Uh, my, the title of my speech today is Freeing the Dove, and it's about my story uh, growing up and living here in the U.S. Um, at the heart of the world map, a small piece of land, green landscapes laying between the Mediterranean Sea to the west and the Jordan River to the east. The soil rich with natural resources, history and culture. Oranges, olives and tomatoes are amongst the most famous trading goods. This is how they describe Palestine in history books, at schools. But that's not the Palestine I grew up in and the Palestine I know. My name is Walid Isa. I'm a Muslim. Arab, Palestinian from Bethlehem. I grew up in the Hesha refugee camp with five sisters and three brothers. Though not wealthy, my family is rich when it comes to care and compassion. I grew up in the beautiful land of Palestine. I grew up loving my identity, my history, and my culture. I can still hear the echo of my grandfather's story about the glory of the olive trees in Palestine. My grandfather planted a seed of love for my country that has grown to be a strong tree in my heart. It was a sunny, beautiful day in Palestine when today's story begins. On March 23, 2003, I was 16 years old. I was out with some of my friends at a coffee shop in the heart of the old city in Bethlehem. I can still remember the smell of the coffee mixed with the scent of spices in the air. I was sitting next to the door when I saw a car that I recognized coming towards the coffee shop. It was my school teacher's car. He and his daughter, Christina, were in it. My teacher had taught me most of my morals and values as I was growing up. I ran outside to wave and greet at him. All of a sudden, a big white van swerved towards us from the other direction, putting me in the middle and three scary men, holding fully automatic guns, jumped out of the car and started aiming their weapons at my school teacher's car. My heart was racing. I ran back to the coffee shop in panic. I peered out of the little window by the door. The three big scary men started showering my school teacher's car with bullets. I strained to see my teacher and his family, but the bullets had smashed through the back window blood covering the glass slowly. The faces in the car had start disappearing. I couldn't see Christina's face, beautiful face anymore. All I could see was blood everywhere. Before I looked and the scary men were gone and I was in the middle of the street by myself. I ran out the coffee shop to go and check on my teacher and his daughter. But as a 16 year old, I could do nothing but wipe their blood with my white shirt. I cried, I screamed for help. Finally, my dad came and took me home. On that day, I stopped seeing Bethlehem as a holy place. I stopped seeing Palestine as a holy land. All I wanted to do was run as far, as, uh, far away as I could. I had decided that when I grow up, I will get myself the biggest AK-47 in the world, big enough to, call, to kill those men who killed the child in myself, in me. My family tried to help me transfer all this negative energy and hate that I had planted in my heart into something that would make me appreciate life again. Through their efforts and through my school, Dar al Kanima, I was accepted in a two-week Minnesota program called Ark for Peace. Though 
ARC would be my last vacation. Because I would go to the US, I would go to Minnesota, I would even check Mall of America. <laughs> I would spend the summer there, and then I would return to Bethlehem, find that really big AK-47, seek revenge. In fact, ARC was a critical point in my life. At ARC, I met with youth from Guatemala, Lithuania, and African, Caucasians, and Native Americans. Through connecting with people from different backgrounds, I learned how to appreciate humanity and value cultures and ethnicity. At ARC, I understood how important it is to be open-minded and be educated to make a difference. After two weeks, ARC came to an end, and I went back to Palestine, and I finished high school. But because of the limited resources my family had, I couldn't make it into college at home. During my... Uh, uh, during ARC, I stayed um, with my American family, Kate and Steve Peer, who was so generous to help me get accepted into college in the United States. They hosted me at their home and accepted me as their son. My American siblings, Elena, Mark, and Garrett, pushed me to explore and helped me walk my journey in pure love and confidence. In May 2012, I graduated from St. Cloud State University with a bachelor's degree in economics and mathematics. At St. Cloud, with the help of my professors and varied activities that took place on campus, I realized that education includes spirit of help and involvement. That spirit was telling me that I need to go back and make my homeland a safer place for my children and my family. I need to take part in this and help create a new, better story for the Middle East. I asked myself, where should I start? What should I do? I, I, I researched, I looked everywhere. A couple years ago, I witnessed miracle happening. I joined a program called the New Story Leadership, a program that pairs Palestinians and Israelis to work and live together in Washington, DC. Even great, greater than the inspiration found in every corner in Washington, DC, from the Congress to the memorials and the hospitality and the generosity of the American family there, they inspired me with hard work and kindness to help me, to help me and my Israeli host brother, Lior, um, to, 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 to start to get to know each other. Lior, who's an Israeli and I, came from, from two different sides of the conflict. But we refused to be enemies, simply because we thought of the bright future that we dream about more than the differences we share. Lior worked with, Con with Colorado Representative Paulus, and I worked at the Americans for Peace Now, a pro-Israeli Jewish lobby firm. After the first day, I couldn't go wait to go back and talk to Lior about the Jewish community here in the US. And he couldn't wait to talk to me about the American slangs he heard throughout the Congress. Throughout the summer, as much as we argued, cried, we screamed at each other, and shared memories about the pain we had, we had growing up in the conflict, we still shared laughs and enjoyable conversations. It was hard for me to work in a pro-Israeli firm. It was very hard to see their flags hanging in my office. The same flag I saw at checkpoints and on top of tanks that bombed my refugee camp. In spite of all that, the, wonderf the wonderful crew at the Americans for Peace Now made me, made me feel very welcomed. My friends, last summer, there was yet another devastating war that caused nearly 2,000 deaths and 10,000 10, wounded and paralyzed. Every city today in the West Bank is sieged. And once again, kids in the city, kids are the price of the conflict. Scared, worried, patiently waiting for Christmas. The question remains what tomorrow will look like. Are we, worried, are we willing to work to restore empathy, morality, and values, and actively create a path for peace? Are we willing to turn down the volume of politicians delivering the most hateful comments and empower the witnesses? Every day, my friends, we make a decision, some based on love and some based on fear. To make a difference, we have to act, not just react. History is full of pain, injustice, and messages of fear. When a Jewish kid says never again, that means never again. When a Chicano kid dreams, hopes, and asks not to be treated as a demographic threat, and an outsider to be seen as a son with hopes and dreams, he means it. When a Palestinian kid asks for a country to live in as first-class citizen and contribute to humanity, 
in the name of, him, the name of his own people, he means it. When an African-American kid, teenager, dreams, hopes, and pleads for his dream not to be shattered in the street, he means it. When students ask to get guns out of their classrooms, they mean it. When a Syrian kid asks to let our human values overcomes our toxic nationalistic fear, he also mean it. How should we hear these messages? And what is our responsibility? I respect my past, but I don't want to live in it. I'm young enough to dream, to believe that change is possible and that fear can be defeated. We are a generation that is capable of positive influence and we can genuinely help. To do so, we have to love what we do, love each other and trust one another. Our passion and love should influence us and drive us to be creative and innovative to promote change. We can make an impact locally and change globally based on our tiny ripples of hope that comes to life from our passion and love. We should not let fear, pain, and hate drive our communications and relationships. Nelson Mandela loved his people more than he feared segregation. Martin Luther King, hopes and dreams were based on belief, love and passion, and, strong, and stronger than slavery. We can follow the example of these men who saw the need for change and risked everything to make it happen. Social scientists tell us that college years are the time of life when character is shaped and determined. They tell us that the grief of comfort one will have for the rest of their life with people of cultures and racial differences is established. And that we, as young adults, will be deeply influenced by the range of experiences during our key development years. Making the effort to become comfortable with our diversity leads not only to acceptance of our differences, but an appreciation for them. Engaging the other produce adults who are not comfortable with polarizing point of view or problem solving that favors the interest of one group without appreciating the legitimate interest of another. If we want to develop into more tolerant adults and effective problem solvers, we have to create the space to get to know one another, appreciate the relationships we build that push us to think, do, and be the difference in this world. We have to start allowing the new generation to meet. We have to allow never again to meet enough is enough. Kennedy once said, there are those who look at the, world, the things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. I would like to end by reminding all of us that flowers are not the same. Different colors, different smells, and no flower can grow in the dark. The Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish wrote one of, my, one of my favorite poems, actually. I dream of the white lilies, a street of sun, a house of light. I dream of a kind heart, not a bullet. I need a bright day, not a mad, fascist moment of triumph. I need a child to cherish a day of laughter not a weapon of war. I came to live for rising suns, not to witness their settings. My friends, let us no longer be silent. Let us no longer live in fear. Let us no longer let hate and extremism drive our life. Let us start moving from the unkind past to the hopeful future. Let us start moving from diversity to respectful, pluralistic society. Let us start moving from tolerance to hospitality. My friend, I found the first step to start. I refuse to hate. My suffering and others' suffering is man's made. Peace is not God's gift on earth, it's people's gift to each other. Thank you. talked a lot about the problem of 
identity and the work that you've done with others to try to find new narratives, new common narratives. Can you talk about a little bit about what that means to you and how you're trying to identify with people personally? Yes. Hear their stories. Yes, exactly. I'm <clears throat> and I would like to share a small story of my grandfather, actually. And my grandfather, in 1948, um, when he became a refugee, he actually was married in 1947. Uh, 1948, my grandma was pregnant, so he wanted his first child to be born in a, in, a, in a safe environment. So he closed the door in his house in Jerusalem and prayed to God that the war will end in two weeks so he can come back to his house. He took my grandma and they started in their journey to Bethlehem, in a small little cave outside Bethlehem in Bethlehem where my father was born. I'm not talking about Jesus here, it's my, daughter, my father's story. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Jesus would be your brother. <laughs> um, before I came to the United States of America, my, father, my grandfather took me to the side. And he told me, Walid, I don't have money to give you. I wish I do. I have very something that is very special. And I think you're a very smart kid. I want to give it to you. Please keep it and take care of it. He gave me the key of his, of his house that he closed in 1948 before he became a refugee, before he was tanned to the refugee status. To me, coming to the US, I looked at that key every day. I questioned, I was very curious. What does that mean? What does the key that my grandfather gave it to me? You know, mean in terms of my identity? Am I gonna pass this key to my, kid, to my kids? Does my grandfather want me to go and fight to overcome the refugee status? Does he want me to go and, you know, find the AK-47? What does he exactly want me, want, want me to do with the key? To me, my, the key is a, is, is a sim symbolic thing. It's to represent my grandfather's story, represent my father's story, and represent my, my, my story. But also, it's a symbol that motivates me to take action that would shape the future. Um, the key, sometimes, he fed in my self-victimization which is self-destructive victimization mentality of fighting and hitting the other, but often fed also in my self-empowering and self-realization you know, uh, uh, that I need to work hard to create a better future for everybody, to end the refugees' problems all over the world, not only my grandfather's refugee problem. I decided that the key would be the simple symbolism for me to work hard to find a solution to end the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. To me today, my grandfather's key is not only the key that he closed his house with. That key is what pushed me every single day to work hard to end the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. That symbol became to life because of my experience and my cultural experience with my friends and the events that I went to. I attended, you know, I grew up in a Lutheran church. Dar al Kalima is a Lutheran church, I was a Muslim. I've been living with a Catholic family for the last nine years. I attended Shabbat dinners. I met you know, my friends from different cultures and different ethnicities. And all these played a role in seeing, identifying the story and what am I gonna do with my grandfather's key. Our identity is not a static thing. It's a dynamic. It's shifting and changing every day based on our cultural experience and our appreciation to humanity and to help each other. Um, I believe that there is nothing uh, static about our identity and the, and, and the important thing is that we have to work hard to appreciate our human connection and appreciate our connection with each other and see uh, and connect ourselves to the others, connect the heart to the hand, uh, to the mind and connect to the I, to the us, to the now. Um, like Rabbi Hilal who said a thousand years ago, if I'm only for myself, then who am I? If I'm not for others, who's for me? If not now, then when? So we, I think we should start now of connecting my story to the other story. Start sharing stories with kindness and tenderness. Father Mark mentioned you know, some recent comments that uh, Mr. Trump made. I guess, what are your reactions to those? And I think more importantly, what is, what is your response? What is our response? Um, okay. he, he, he does not scare me. That's the thing that scares me is our, 
um, not being able to connect with each other. I think we can actually stop this narrative of hate and fear by getting to know each other and appreciate our differences and celebrate our similarities. Um, it's important that we need to open up to each other and share stories and share a human story that connect us uh, with our common values and our, um, the things that we care about. We should not let things divide us. Like I talked to my, grand, my, my grandfather, Ski. You know, I feel sometimes lucky because I got to, to touch the key that shaped my identity and who I am today. But each one of us today in this church, they have their own key that shaped their own identity. You have a key, everyone has a key. It could be your religion, it could be your ethnicity, it could be your culture, it could be the things you're scared of, it could be your gender, it could be anything. And our role today is not let that key feed in your victimization mentality. Let it feed in your self-constructed mentality. And to do that, we have to share stories and connect with each other and open up to understand each other instead of pointing fingers at each other. People talk about being bilingual, but what's striking is that you strike me as being bicultural. Somebody who can identify with others in multiple contexts. Can you talk about your experience as being an Arab living in the United States, but also being an American, being adopted by Americans? Like, I, I understand that your, your narrative, the way you explain how our identities shift, but can you talk about like your experience first coming to the U.S. Yes. as you were avoiding radicalization because of this act of terror against the, the, that you witnessed? Yeah. You know, sometimes I hear when you say, where is the moderate Arabs? You know, is, they don't understand how hard it is to be moderate. You know, you, you're, you're being attacked by everybody in every corner. Um, you know, I, I, I love my American family. I, I don't really call them American family anymore. They are my family. Um, as my mom, my American mom, she always say, he's my cordless son. Um, I, I'm, I'm very lucky to have them in my life, and I'm very happy to live here. Um, you know, I am who I am today because of, because of the generosity uh, of them bringing me here and pay for my first year of college. But also at the same time, I, I, I um, you know, my first year at St. Cloud and I went to St. Cloud, I was one day going from the library back to my apartment. And there was some, you know, couple students or couple guys, they were following me. I start putting my headphones in my ears, pretending that I'm not listening to them. But I actually listening to them, listening to the racist comments they are saying, and they are following me slowly and calling me names. But I pretended like I'm not listening. I just kept walking my way. They start jumping in front of me, and they want to start pushing me. And I start running, but they were faster than me and pushed me with a rock in the back of my head. I woke up in the, you know, in the hospital in St. Cloud, telling me that we're gonna do MRI. We 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 are scared that there is brain, there is bleeding in the brain. All that, in that moment, I remember my family and the history and my dreams and my hopes, and I worked hard to be here. Racism is real. It's happening every day. And it's our collective responsibility. It's our collective you know, leadership to work really hard with each other to fight and stop the, 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 the extremism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, anything that actually create the other you know, identify the other and create the fear, we have to stop it. Because it's a collective win-win scenario for everybody to stop this narrative. Um, but we should not let the picture be dominated by the extremism. And we always have to remember that in the end of the day, there is millions of my American families around, and they will, st they will stand for what's right, for justice, and for morality. Yes? How have your experiences affected your family, your siblings back home? Um, um, it's actually affected my family overseas and affected my family over here, my American family here. Um, my American family, she, my American mom, she has a group travel agency, so she takes groups overseas. And she visited my family. And the first thing when she came back, she told me, your mom put a whole check in my plate. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Arabs do. They, you know, we are very generous. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't yes. mean that you have to eat some, it all. Some Arabs are more generous than others. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting to see how my American family attitude and how their curiosity, 
they start shifting about wondering what, what, what does that mean uh, to be an Arab? And they start questioning my family and ask me more questions. And by the time the, the questions start getting deeper. And I, I saw beautiful things, how much actually between you know, my American family and my family overseas, they did not know each other. And at this point, it's really amazing how much there is love and there, you know, connection between them. And they talk to each other all the time, which is scary to me because they could share information that I don't want both of them to know. <laughs> but it's, it's, been, it's been a great joy to see how my American family been affected with my family overseas and my family overseas been affected. If this could happen in my life, I believe it could happen everywhere. My, my story is not unique. We can mainstream this by creating a better connection every single level between the American people and the Palestinian, Palestinian people. I, I saw it in my eyes. I witnessed how beautiful it is when you actually let witnesses, you know, authentic voices get to know each other instead of politicians and fear-mongering in the news. So you mentioned something very important. I think it's an important universal value that we have forgotten, and that's the importance of relationships and community and, and like identifying with each other personally. That's something I think Americans could learn from the people of the Middle East, actually. I mean, we tend to be very individualistic, and the Middle East is very group-oriented. But I ask you now, yeah. speaking from the vantage point of this universal wisdom that you bring to us today, if there's a kid from Chicago, or a kid from San Diego, who feels alienated and cut off and abandoned in his depression or in his sense of victim, however ideologically distorted it is, and he's contemplating violence, which is something that has happened in the United States this year as many times as there are days on the calendar. It's not just about terrorism and ISIS and politics. What would you say to that young person my message, I have two messages actually. One message to the kid, and one message is to the, to, the, to the community in general. And I was just writing an article about this, a specific point, about our educational institutions and the way we identify achievement and success. Uh, my self-worth, to me, is not identified by the degree I got from college. My self-worth is not by a degrading grade that I had at the end of the semester. My self-worth is actually a mix of the academic classes that I took, but also with the relationships I built. My grandfather's story, my culture, my, you know, the music I listened to, um, you know, my roots, going with my family to you know, pick up olives, and you know, the Shabbat dinners, the, you know, the masses, the Catholic mass that I went to, all these added to, 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 to my self-worth, to my understanding of my identity and who I am. And I think it's very important to avoid alienated kids. And I talk to college kids every single day. We have to rethink education and rethink of how we teach our kids what does success mean, what does achievement mean. It does not mean only well-paid job. It means relationships. It means values. It means caring about the other. And that is what we need to start doing in our education system. And this is my message to the society and to our educational institutions. I mean, my message to the kid, you know, every one of us has the potential to be a terrorist or a be, you know, a destructive. Well, we have a potential also to be loving, caring people. It's like two walls. It depends on which wall you want to feed. And I think we have to empower these kids and create, you know, a way for them to see the importance of feeding the loving part, not the alienated part. Mm -hmm. And we can do that, and they can see that, but we have to um, not avoid them, but actually engage them and integrate them in the society so they can express their fear and their concerns and their weaknesses, our mental problems. Um, if, we, if we define success and achievement in a certain way and we create a stigma with all others that we identify success with, we will always re have alienated people and people who are not integrated. I think the first step is to redefine success and redefine achievements to stop the stigma. So when you talk to your brothers and sisters about these beliefs of yours, are they 
all in agreement with you? Do you have to convince them? Um, do they say, ah, you're dreaming, this isn't practical? What do they, what do they say when you, uh, when, you talk, when you talk to them? And, and what do you do to convince them? You know, I, I, I uh, you know, it's not about convincing. It's, it's about, you know, my experience. It's a set of experiences that made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. Of course, my brothers and sisters, they had different experience in their life. Uh -huh. And they don't agree with everything they say, and I don't agree with everything they say. But we are willing to open up and share and tell, where did you come up with this idea? And how did you end up here? And I think, you know, it's basically from when we want to move from diversity to pluralistic society, you know, it's not about teaching. We love the concept of teaching. We want to teach kids, our kids everything. But sometimes, here in the US, they say you could actually give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. You could teach him how to fish and he will, he will eat, you know, for the rest of his life. But both of them are wrong. Sometimes it's not about giving them fish. It's not about teaching them fish. It's about giving them an opportunity to go fishing in their own. What I do with my sisters and my brothers, I'm not trying to tell them. I'm not trying to give them or teach them. I'm just trying to give them an opportunity to have the experience that they have. And how do you do that? How do you give them that opportunity? By letting them introduce them to the people and an and, and, and open space. And open the door for them to, to enter my, my life and my relationships and the community that I you know, attend and participate and um, share my knowledge with. I think what I hear you saying is it's not about convincing people about an argument, it's about loving people. It's about reaching people. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's about giving people a hand to, to, to get his strength. It's not about doing the job for people. Yes? I know this is kind of a difficult question. People have asked me this question. Sure. They don't have the answer, but what can the average person here do to try to help resolve some of the conflicts overseas? I mean, you can take the Israel-Palestine conflict for an example, but there are other conflicts. But, I mean, do we just have to kind of passively shrug our shoulders and say, we don't have any power over this? Or what can we do? It's, yes, this is a very good question. And it's a very hard question. Uh, because people often, they are, you know, they lost hope in the political system, in the Congress, or the Senate, and all these. And I understand, because I, I work in the Congress, and I know, for God's sake, how, how they act sometimes, but um, it's important. There's very good organizations around the Twin Cities who are working very hard, very day, uh, to convince these policy makers in making a difference. And I, you guys should get to know them. Um, for example, one of the organizations is sort of Peace Project. I, you know, I've been attending some of their uh, events and I went with them actually to a couple of the legislators to talk about Syria and talk about uh, Palestine. And I, I think it's wonderful. They're doing a wonderful job. I think we need to get to know each other and need to know what's the societies and our neighbors. Uh, we need to move from, you know, uh, diversity to neighboring, to start getting to know our neighbors. And by knowing who are around us and what do they do, and join them in creating and convincing and making a better world. Um, we, have very, we have a great asset that we need to use, which is our neighbors. We need to get to know who's around us and what are their organization, what's their work, and try to join them. And this is what I do, honestly. I don't know if that's a satisfying question, but you know, this is my, uh, my humble, humble opinion, opinion. As a Palestinian that is choosing to let go of whether it be fear or hate or um, whether it's the Israelis or anybody else, does that in turn isolate you from the greater Palestinian community if it's, there's more um, weight behind the fear in that, in that group? So does, does choosing to let go of that, does that in turn set, you know, Palestinians or the Arabs almost against you in a, in a sense? Of course. Some of them, not all of them. I mean, you know, some, it's very hard to tell them, tell anyone that revenge is not going to get you anywhere. Let's just create life worth living instead of fighting for death. 
um, it's very hard when people are losing everything you know overseas it's very hard to go talk to a woman who just lost her kid about forgiveness but I have to be honest to myself and to my morality and to my values and I believe that you know forgiveness and kindness is the only way for not only the Palestinians or the Israelis for humankind um, I don't think there is other way um, other than working really hard because it's not an easy way it's easier way it's easy for me to stay to stand here and tell you Israelis did this and that and you know Palestinians but it's not gonna get us anywhere we have to start you know creating a win-win scenario and trying to connect and build connection at every level between people who are different than each other that's how we make a real difference yes. How influential is Dr. Mitri Rahim on your work here in the US and what you're trying to accomplish? He's actually, you know <laughs> so after when I was 16 years old after that accident when I uh, Christina, she died and Georgie actually survived uh, my, my father was lost. He did not know what to do. He sent me to a, a private school. Uh, you know, imagine yourself have nine kids. That it's, it's, it's a lot of, you know, money. <laughs> a lot of work. And my dad, he sent me to a private school that actually costed him two-thirds of his annual salary to send me to this private school for someone who has nine. But he knew that if he not, does not do that, he would lose his kid to violence. So my dad trying to protect me, sending me to a private school that focused on nonviolence and healing. Um, you know, and suddenly he found Reverend Mitri Rahib, who was uh, just starting the Dar Kalima School, which is focused on nonviolence and healing. And Reverend Mitri Rahib and the Lutheran Church, they brought me and actually, uh, uh, through the Quaker School, the French School, and uh, the Lutheran Church High School, I was uh, accepted in Dar al Kalima, and Reverend Mitri Rahib, he uh, actually gave me a very generous scholarship. Um, he actually saved me and made it easier for my dad to take care of the rest of my eight sisters and brother. I owe him a huge, uh, um, he made a, a huge change in my life. And actually, Reverend Mitri Rahib, he used to come every Thursday, give us a lesson from the Bible and a story about our life and about morality and values. And I was fascinated by his um, degree of, of, of caring about humanity and values, even in the darkest moment of the conflict. And that was amazing to me. Um, I loved it and I'm thankful for his leadership and for his uh, generosity in my life. We want to thank you for your job. Thank you. I, just, I, want to, I, want to, I want to just express my deepest gratitude to you for coming to speak with thank us you. today. It's an honor for us to have you here. Thank you. And uh, for me personally, to have a connection to my motherland is so important. When we were meeting just a few days ago, walking, we had some Chipotle, and, we're just, and no one got sick from E. coli. <laughs> and what struck me was that in another time, in another place, in another circumstance, we would have been walking together in Bethlehem. I'm glad we're walking together here in Minnesota, and I hope we continue this journey. Again, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much. To be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it. it, it for those of you who are visiting, you're lucky because Orthodox Jews you drag it on. <laughs> so we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.